The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Cindy Andrake, and I am the Manager of Family Support here at the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. The Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to finding causes and cures for pediatric cardiomyopathy through the support of research, education, awareness, and advocacy. Established in 2002, CCF has grown into a global community of families, physicians, and scientists focusing on improving in diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life for children with cardiomyopathy. To find out more about CCS programs, resources, and services, please visit our website at childrenscardiomyopathy.org. Today, uh, we're pleased to present uh, and host the Heart Failure and Ventricular Assist Devices webinar with Dr. Nihab Benzel as our guest presenter. Before I turn over um, the presentation to Dr. Benzel, I have a few housekeeping uh, things to go through. If at any point during the presentation, uh, you need some technical assistance, please type your concerns into the chat window. If you have audio issues, you should be able to switch between your computer speakers and phone if necessary. To provide the highest quality um, sound, we are, have all of the attendees in the listen-only mode during the presentation. However, your questions are important, and we hope that you will ask questions throughout the presentation. We'll reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation to answer your questions, so please submit them. Um, the place to submit the questions is on the control panel in the question box. Um, you just click on that, and you can put your questions there. If for some reason the control panel is preventing you from seeing the screen, you can minimize it by clicking on the small orange arrow at the top of the control panel, which is at the top left. Um, and then if you want to redisplay the control panel, all you need to do is click the orange uh, button again. We will be recording this and it will be available on our YouTube channel and you will get information about that at the conclusion of the presentation. So now it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Neha Bansal as our webinar presenter. Uh, she had a busy day and uh, we are so pleased that she could be with us tonight. Uh, Neha Bansal is an attending physician in the Department of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Montefiore and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She is also the medical director of the Pediatric Heart Transplant Program at Children's Hospital of Montefiore. Dr. Benzel received her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery in 2011 at Seth G.S. Medical College and KEM Hospital in Mumbai, India. From 2012 to 2018, she completed her residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at the Children's Hospital in Michigan. Dr. Penzel's research focuses on pediatric cardiomyopathy, pediatric cardiac transplants, pediatric cardio-oncology. In 2017, Dr. Penzel received the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation and Kyle John Rosimsky Foundation's Research Scholar Award. She is a board certified by the American College of Pediatrics. She is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology since 2019 and a member of numerous professional societies, including the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, Pediatric Heart Transplant Society, Action Network, and the American Society of Echocardiography. Dr. Benzel, thank you so much for being with us. Do you want to jump on? Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much for um, uh, introducing me. And I really want to thank CDF for inviting me here to give this talk to all the families. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right, so um, I'll get started. So today we'll be talking about uh, heart failure and ventricular assist devices. Um, this is specifically focused on pediatric heart failure and pediatric ventricular assist devices. So first is, what is heart failure? So the definition of heart failure in, um, in short is inability of the heart to keep up with the body's metabolic demands. So whatever the body needs to do, the heart is not able to provide the energy, the blood to be able to do that. Um, the heart failure over a um, period of time, um, so this increased workload, uh, will produce changes in the heart. It reduces the contractility 
um, due to the overloading of the ventricle, ventricle being one of the chambers of the heart. There is also increase in heart rate to maintain the cardiac output, the output of the heart. Hypertrophy of the myocardium, that means that the, the myocardium, which is the muscle of the heart, becomes thick. And this happens because um, the heart muscle is trying to improve its own contractility and in the process becomes thick. And as you can imagine, because it's trying to pump more blood, the, it results in enlargement of the heart ventricles or the, the, or the chambers of the heart. And it makes it a very spherical shape instead of the normal bullet shape of the heart that we see, it becomes very globular and spherical. There are many ways to categorize heart failure. So you can categorize it by which side of the heart is involved. Is it the left side of the heart or the right side of the heart? Um, whether the ab abnormality is because of abnormal contraction, which we call systolic dysfunction, or is it because the heart cannot relax, or we call it diastolic dysfunction? We look at also the functional impairment of the, of the patient. We can also classify heart failure by that. Degree of functional impairment means what are the things that um, the patient can do? We call it the New York Heart Association functional classification, and you may have heard this NYHA classification. In pediatrics, sometimes we also use the ROS classification. And we look at what are some of the things that patients can or cannot do and how impaired they are. It can also be a problem in, uh, because of backflow. So now the heart cannot squeeze, so all the blood gets backed up into the veins, and we call that backward failure. Or the heart cannot squeeze enough, and enough blood does not go forward, yeah, and um, we cannot perfuse all the organs, and we call that forward failure. So many ways to classify or categorize heart failure. This is the New York Heart Association heart failure classes, so one to four, one being that there is no limitation to physical activity, and four being that patients are unable to do anything, and they're also symptomatic just at rest, at sitting down. They're very in a lot of discomfort. And this is the Ross heart failure classification, which we've modified the New York Heart Association classification to look at pediatrics, to look at kids and see what are the functional classes for kids. So we cannot ask a kid, oh, can, do you feel tired doing, you know, walking up a flight of stairs? So for kids and toddlers, we look at how, what do they do? Um, how do they do when, you give them feeds because feeds is exercise of an infant. So are they uh, really um, tachypnic or what we call increased work of breathing? So do they have increased work of breathing? Are they sweating with feeds? That means that they're tiring out. Um, so class one being patients who are asymptomatic and class four being patients are grunting, having retractions or really increased work of breathing at rest. So that is our functional classification. And there is something called staging of heart failure, which was done by the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. Stage is basically looking at patients A to D and what is their risk and where they are in their disease process. So stage A being patients who are known to be predisposed to heart failure, who are at risk, patients who received chemotherapy, patients who have hypertension, diabetes, patients who are obese, these patients are at risk of heart failure, so they're stage A. Stage B are patients who have some, um, uh, some um, uh, structural abnormality, so they have what we call ejection fraction as to how much the heart is squeezing. They have low ejection fraction or some sort of valve problem, but they don't have heart failure in terms of their signs or symptoms. They, we call them stage B. Patients who have any sort of symptoms of heart failure, so whether they're NYHA class three or four, we list them in stage C because these patients have had some form of heart failure. And stage D are patients who have had advanced heart failure, very severe symptoms, and they, um, they need some sort of advanced therapy. And these are sort of the patients that we're gonna be focusing on today when we talk about ventricular assist devices. 
So heart failure can be managed in an acute setting or in a chronic setting. Acute setting being when um, you first, sometimes you first present for your heart failure, you are treated with diuretics, you're given IV medications called inotropes, Sometimes you need an intubation, which is a tube that uh, and hooked onto a ventilator to help you breathe. And the last thing is that your body, your heart cannot sufficiently provide blood to your organs and you are given mechanical support. So either it is ECMO, you might have heard that, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is like a heart-lung machine, um, or you're given a VAD, which is called a ventricular assist device. Chronic management um, of heart failure is done in an outpatient setting where patients are at home. There are certain medications like diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers um, that we use in these patients. And of course, we all know that the gold standard of treatment of heart failure, if not recovery, is heart transplantation. So today we're going to be talking about mechanical circulatory support in acute heart failure. So let's talk about ventricular assist devices. What is a ventricular assist device? So these are electrical or battery operated mechanical heart pumps. It assists with, sometimes it assists and sometimes it completely takes over the pumping function of a weak or damaged heart. Now we know that the heart has two ventricles or two sides. So a ventricular assist device can assist only the right side when it's called an RVAD or a right ventricular assist device, can assist only the left side or an LVAD. And sometimes we can have two VADs in the same patient and it assists both ventricles and we call it a bivad, biventricular assist devices. It allows for delivery of the oxygenated blood to vital organs. And this is the most important part of a ventricular assist device. Very important to know this only supports the heart. It does not support the lungs. So unlike a heart-lung machine, where both your heart and your lung are supported, a ventricular assist device only supports your heart. What are some of the indications for using ventricular assist device? So again, we all know that cardiac transplantation is the gold standard for treatment of patients with end-stage heart failure, but we know that donor hearts are a scarce resource. So sometimes patients have to wait longer on wait lists to get a donor heart. And ventricular assist device treatments provides them an important option for survival and not just survival, but with improved quality of life. And this is why we use VADs. So VADs can be used in multiple ways. So an LVAD can be used as a bridge to transplant, destination therapy, bridge to recovery, and bridge to decision, and we'll go over some of these. So what do we mean when we say that we're going to use VAD as a bridge to transplant? So if we know that a patient is not expected to survive the wait time for a donor heart, we will be implanting a VAD as a bridge to transplant. The patient benefits from an improved functional capacity and quality of life and enters the transplant surgery in a much better physical and functional shape. And that is what we mean that we're going to be using VAD as a bridge to transplant. VAD as bridge to recovery. So sometimes we have patients, for example, with myocarditis which is an infection of the heart where the heart muscle weakens temporarily, we expect those patients sometimes to recover their heart function. But in the interim, in the acute phase, they may need some help. And so we use VAD support and optimize their heart failure medication regimen to give an opportunity for the heart to remodel and recover. And we want the ejection fraction or the uh, percentage of the blood that goes out of the heart enough or sufficient to allow for explantation of a ventricular assist device, thus eliminating any need for a transplant. Usually patients with acute onset of cardiomyopathy like myocarditis fall into this um, category 
where we sometimes implant ventricular assist devices as a bridge to recovery. What do we mean when we say VAD as destination therapy? So if we determine that a patient is not eligible for a heart transplant, but will benefit for some, uh, with, uh, uh, from a VAD for end-stage heart failure, those are patients that we can implant a VAD as destination therapy. Sometimes you can have comorbidities like cancer or chronic kidney disease that require dialysis, and maybe the patient's not a candidate for kidney transplant. So we cannot do kidney and heart transplant together. So if we determine that patient does not meet criteria for a heart transplant, but we want to offer um, this patient some sort of assistance with their heart failure, we can implant a VAD. This is very common in the adult patients, not as common in pediatrics, but slowly being accepted as a modality in patients like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, who we know are not heart transplant candidates. And the last one was bridge to decision. So if we do not know whether patient is eligible for transplant or not, we can place a VAD for that patient and wait till the, the care team can decide whether this patient is eligible or not eligible for a heart transplant, and then change the course of VAD as either destination therapy or bridge to transplant. So let's look at some trends and outcomes for VADs. So this is from the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. And over here in this graph, you can see blue are the patients who are on ECMO, green are the patients who are on VAD, and yellow are the patients who are either on VAD or ECMO. Now compared to the 2005, 6, 7, 8 era, if you look at the current era, 2013, 14, 15, you can appreciate that the number of patients who are getting VADs uh, as bridged, um, bridged with VAD to a transplant is increasing. We can then also look um, by the type of VAD. So 20% of the patients receive an LVAD, 5% BIVADs. So if you look at the total number of patients who are now being bridged with some form of a VAD or ECMO, what we call mechanical circulatory support, it's almost 30%. Now we can also look at what are the types of patients who are getting this kind of um, circulatory support or VADs. So if you look at the second um, uh, graph here, which is LVAD, which is left ventricular assist device, which is the most common one, the yellow are the patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy. The green are the patients who have some form of congenital heart disease and red are the patients who are requiring a retransplant. So over here, you can see that cardiodilated cardiomyopathy is the most predominant diagnosis that uh, patients require uh, an LVAD or who are being bridged with an LVAD to transplant. We can then look at different age groups for patients who are being bridged at L, uh, with um, VADs to transplant. So less than one year, we have 22%. One to five years, we have 34%. Six to 10 is 32%. 11 to 17 is 34%. And again, as you can see, there are more VADs in the current era from 2010 to 2018 than ECMO. In the younger age group, because of their size, sometimes we do not have very good outcomes and options for devices. And that is the reason you see almost similar percentages when it comes more than one year of age. Now let's split this up by diagnosis again. So again, as you can see, patients on the right are dilated cardiomyopathies and patients on the left are congenital heart disease. And you can see here that dilated cardiomyopathy is a predominant reason or diagnosis for the reason of implanting a VAD. Again, green being VADs and blue being ECMO. So you can see that majority of the patients in the current era from 2010 to 2018 are being bridged to transplant 
with a VAD. This is a paper that looked at two eras, so 1999 to 2004, and compared it to era two, which was 2005 to 2012. So we consider the second era to be an era of pediatric ventricular assist devices. And in the current era, we saw a 50% reduction in weightless mortality, uh, which is considered the era of pediatric VADs. Now, if you look at the survival curve, again, data from the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant, the green curve, which is sort of hidden in the back, are patients who have VADs, but no ECMO. And red is the line which shows patients who don't have any ECMO, no VAD, and directly get a heart transplant. And you can see that they overlap, meaning that patients who get VAD and then get a transplant or patients who don't get a VAD or ECMO and get a transplant have very comparable outcomes. The line that is blue are patients who get bridged to transplant using ECMO. As you can imagine, they have um, significant um, comorbidities and problems and uh, complications and they um, sometimes have um, it, worse outcomes than other patients. It's very important to see that getting you a VAD is actually uh, not at a disadvantage in the current era. What are some, sorry, what are some types of VADs? Um, so VADs can be short-term, long-term, external, or internal. By external and internal, I mean that external, whether they can be outside or internal, that they're implantable inside the body. And short-term and long-term are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, it depends on the duration of support. So ventricular device innovation has dramatically improved outcomes for patients with advanced heart failure, and this is both in adults and in pediatrics. We started with a heart meet XVE back in 2001 that the FDA approved, and this was a pulsatile VAT. What that means is that the, uh, how, just how we feel our pulse and the heart is pulsatile, so with every beat you feel a pulse, that is what the heart meet XVE was. But over a period of time, we've now seen many continuous flow devices. What this means is that you will not feel a pulse, but patients get a continuous flow of blood flow, continuous flow of blood throughout their body using this assist device. The FDA approved the HeartMate 2 in 2008, but the most interesting device in the current era in the adult world is the HeartMate 3. The FDA approved it in 2017, and then in 2020, it got the pediatric label. In 2020, it was also approved for just destination therapy and not just a bridge to transplant. So let's um, discuss just overall some common problems that we see with VADs or some common complications. So the first and foremost is pump thrombus. So as you can imagine, it is a machine that sits um, inside the heart or outside the heart where the blood comes in contact with it. So the blood has a tendency to clot. So because we want to prevent that, the patients who get VADs are often on anticoagulation or blood thinners. Now we have to monitor these patients very closely for any pump thrombus uh, with monitoring their labs, their blood work, or looking at their pump parameters. So we look at a lot of meters like um, uh, their power, their uh, rotations per minute, um, and the flow that they're giving. So, so those things we look at um, very closely to monitor for any pump thrombus. Um, so initially, the way any VAD is managed is with um, hospitalization, obviously, and they get IV medications like IV heparin or IV bivalirudin. If a patient is considered dischargeable on a VAD, sometimes you can go home on Coumadin or Warfarin, which is also a blood thinner. And a lot of these patients are on some form of antiplatelet therapy. 
like aspirin, Plavix, uh, Pristantine. So these are some of the um, medications that prevent the platelets from, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, platelets from coming in contact with each other and forming a clot. But as you can imagine, with blood thinners, if you're worried about thrombus, you also get worried about bleeding. So we put them on anticoagulation because we're worried about some form of thrombus or that thrombus flying somewhere and causing issues. But of course, there are also issues with bleeding. There's something called acquired von Willebrand syndrome, which occurs from just the sheer forces that are created by the VAD itself. Um, so we always uh, watch for that. Um, we sometimes see arteriovenous malformations because there is reduced pulse pressure. So there is not a, a pulse that is going on. There's just this continuous flow. So because the pulse pressure or the difference in your systolic and your diastolic is very low, it sometimes creates what we call arteriovenous malformations, which is basically your arteries and the veins um, start talking to each other, and that causes problems. And patients can be at risk for bleeds in their gastrointestinal system. They can be at risk for bleeding through their nose, epistaxis. So we monitor patients very closely for symptoms. We monitor their hemoglobin. We monitor uh, for like blood in the stools, which is called melana, dark stools. Um, so we can often always reverse bleeding uh, with, you know, controlling anticoagulation. But then you can imagine this puts these patients at risk for thrombus or pump thrombus or even a stroke. Um, patients are also at risk for arrhythmias. As you can imagine that these patients have um, a, a cannula that is sitting in their left ventricle. So that can tickle the heart and cause various abnormal rhythms. The treatment for these abnormal rhythms is no different than in patients who don't have VADs. And you can also cardioverter or defibrillate these patients, you know, using those pads and giving them a shock, but obviously it comes with its own set of risks. And um, infections is one of the major problems as well, because now you have a surgical site uh, where you've implanted this device. In a lot of these devices, you have this drive line that comes out and connects to either the power outlet or the batteries. You have the device that is sitting either inside the heart, uh, for most of the time, the sitting inside the heart, and the pump itself, which is a foreign body that is sitting inside the, inside the human body. Um, so those are all risks for infection. You can have fever, redness, pain at the site, and sometimes you may need to exchange the pump or the drive line. If you um, only have the left side that is assisted, sometimes the right side can also fail and you can have some low flows because now the right side of the heart is not able to give the blood to the left side for the pump to work effectively. And the treatment is very complex and requires IV medications, um, sometimes even vasodilators, you might have heard of sildenafil, um, but sometimes these patients may then need a bivad or they already have an LVAD and now they need a right-sided assist device as well. I think I skipped over one slide, I'm so sorry. So here, so one of the most important um, risk or complications of VAD in pediatrics that we worry about is stroke. So if you have a clot that is on the left side of the heart, it can go to your brain and cause a stroke. Sometimes the patients can also bleed into their brains and that can also cause something called an, a hemorrhagic stroke. So these patients are at very high risk of ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes, almost 25 to 30%, which is a very high number. And you can look for signs like vomiting, headaches or other signs of stroke. And this is very um, scary complications for parents because we don't know how devastating a stroke may be in different patients. So let's talk and go through some different types of mechanical circulatory support. 
So it's, as I said, there are short-term support devices. So you have something called ECMO, which we won't be talking about today. It's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is a heart-lung machine. Then you have something called a Centromag. And if you have lower size cannula or smaller size cannula, they're now called the PDMAG. And then you have the long-term support devices, long-term VADs. There are some of them um, here called the Berlin X-Core Heart, the Heartware or the HVAD, the HeartMate 3, there used to be HeartMate 2 before, and also the Total Artificial Heart. And I will go through some of them today with you. So let's talk about Centromag or PDMag for now. So this is again a continuous flow pump. So as you can see here in the picture, it is a rotor that is sitting, it is magnetically levitated. So there are two magnets that are sitting on top of each other and rotating. And this rotary sits outside the heart. It can be both for pediatrics and adults, depending on the size of the cannula. It can provide flows up to almost 10 liters. And depending on the size of the cannula, you can get, put it in a baby as well as all the way into a huge adult. So it's a very um, versatile device. So these are some of the pictures just to give you an example of the setup. So down here, you can see this sweet little girl who has a Centromag LVAD. So only one side is supported. You can see these two cannula that are bringing blood back into this device that is sitting here. And then another cannula that is taking blood back. So, and you can see here, the second slot is empty. That makes me believe only one side of her heart is being supported. This is a close-up of the device itself. You have one cannula that brings the blood out into this device and another cannula that takes the blood back to the body. This is how the, um, the, the system looks like to us as physicians. And on the right here, you see a setup that is a system that is set up for bivads. So over here on the left, in the red, you can see the left side, which means the oxygenated blood, the red blood. And on the, on the left, sorry. And on the right here, you see blue. In blue, you have the right side of the heart that is um, supported, the blue blood or the deoxygenated blood. And you have two displays here, and then these are the two slots. So this is how um, two different, uh, two sides of the heart can be supported by two different pumps connected to the same machine and the monitor. So what are the main indications for using a Centromag by the, uh, Centromag is if you have some sort of an LVAD and now remember I talked about right side of the heart failing or an RVAD. So sometimes these patients need temporary support of the right side. And you can need sometimes temporary support even after a transplant. So if you need a temporary right side support, um, you can put in um, an RVAD as a Centromag. Sometimes you can bridge uh, patients to transplant using just Centromags as just an LVAD or BIVADs. And if you are doing something urgently or emergently, and want to wait to give a long-term VAD to these patients later, this can be used in patients, pediatric patients, um, as a bridge to Berlin Heart or even HeartMate threes. Um, so then let's talk about some long-term support devices. So I have the Berlin X Core next. So Berlin X Core is specifically designed for infants and children. It was the only dedicated pediatric device that was FDA approved for long-term support as a bridge to transplant till very recently, we got the HeartMate 3 that also has a pediatric label now. Um, this is a pulsatile device. It has a pulsatile membrane that pumps and it has implantable sil silicon cannulae that goes inside the heart. On the right here, you can see this picture where you see two ventricular assist devices. So this is a bivad support. Both the ventricles are being supported. 
you see this one cannula going into one ventricle and you see these arrows so blood comes out into this device and then gets pushed back in and this is connected to the aorta or the left side of the heart and that gets um, sends the blood to the rest of the body i would like to show you a quick um, video of this of this device So as you can see here, just starting from the beginning, so this is the Berlin X-Core pump itself. You see this membrane that is sitting in the center and it's pulsatile. It moves um, and uh, there is a vacuum that is created by the machine on one side of the membrane and it makes the membrane pulsatile, which opens these valves accordingly and lets the blood in and then pushes the blood out. This is how a Berlin X-Core pump looks like. Now, as I mentioned, um, the, there are these valves that sit inside the cannulae that open and close according to um, when the vacuum is created. You can have bivad support. There are different sizes. There are different cannulas that come and depending on the size of the patient, you can choose your cannula. So just looking at how it works, so this is the heart, the cannula is attached to the apex of the heart or the tip of the heart, blood comes out, and then it can be pushed back into the different size, si uh, sides of the heart. So this image here tells you various cannula strategies. So it can sometimes be cannulated between the top chambers of the heart or the bottom chambers of the heart. And that is what this slide is telling you that there are various ways and places to put these cannula. It has a pneumatic driver. So every time, which is connected to outside the body, to a machine. And every time this pneumatic driver uh, creates vacuum, blood comes out. And every time the pneumatic driver pushes, the blood goes back in. So again, these are some pictures. So as you can see here, there are different sizes. So there's 10, 25 ml, 30 ml, different cannulas. This is called the ICUS driving unit. This is where the, um, the, the pneumatic driver is connected. This machine is a complex computer that has all the settings and, and works very well, but it is very bulky. So you can see here, this is a patient sitting here and this is the ICUS driving unit. And you can see here that it is very large and bulky. And you can imagine one of this, the problems with this device is that the patient's not very mobile, cannot like walk around the house very, e uh, walk around the hospital very easily. And another thing is that the patients who get onto these VADs cannot go home because it's not really, uh, conducive to teach the families or give them these uh, driving units to go home with. This is how the Berlin heart pump looks like. It sits outside the body. Um, you know, normally in our toddlers, it hangs um, down close to their groin area. And on the right, you can see here, this cute little kid has two Berlin VADs, so the bivad support, right? So one on the right and one on the left. And uh, both his heart chambers are supported. And these patients can thrive um, and, again, go into heart transplant very well supported. Their end organs doing well. They grow, they feed, they do all the normal baby things while being on VADS. This is a study that was done uh, by the Action Network. So Advanced Cardiac Therapy Improving Outcomes Network is a brilliant network of um, multiple centers across uh, North America. And they joined forces and collaborated with the Berlin Heart and uh, conducted their post-surveillance study. So uh, this is the initial study of the pediatric VAD, which is the Berlin Heart. And then this is the post-surveillance study, which was recently published by the Action Network. So you can see here, this is the Berlin Heart Group and the um, post-surveillance study group over here on the right. You can see that we're now supporting even younger patients. So patients almost three months of age. Um, most of the patients are still on one 
uh, ventricle assist device, so LVAD, only the left side of the heart is being supported. And we're supporting more and more patients who have congenital heart disease, um, not, just, um, not just cardiomyopathies. And you can see here that they define success as either they were transplanted or they were weaned off the device or that they were alive on the device at 180 days after implantation. So that is what they consider device success. And you can see that in the initial study group, which was 320 patients, 76% of them reached that success. And the current study group, albeit it was a smaller group of only 72 patients, 86% of them reached that uh, success, uh, device success. And this is the most important um, um, slide, in my opinion, from the Action Network. You can see the initial study group had a 16% stroke rate in the first 30 days, whereas the post-surveillance uh, study group um, was only 5%. That is a huge improvement, and they have achieved this by harmonizing their protocols using bivalorudin um, and just um, strategically utilizing their data to improve outcomes. And looking here is just data that shows that this is the blue is the uh, post surveillance and the orange is the Berlin original Berlin heart study. You can see that the first major adverse event freedom from first major adverse event is significantly better in the in the latest group, which is in the most recent era, as well as freedom from pump replacement. So sometimes when we start to see clots, we start to see fibrin, we have to remove that pump because those patients are at risk for stroke, right? So we have to remove those pumps. And we uh, see that the freedom from, uh, from pump replacement is much higher in the current era. Again, goes to show our better anticoagulation strategies, our better harmonized protocols. The next device I want to show you and talk to you about is called the hardware or the HVAD. Now these are implantable devices. So as you can see, compared to the Berlin where you have the cannulas that sit inside the heart, this is actually a full device that sits or snugs the heart. So you carve out the apex of the heart or the tip of the heart, you carve out this area, you take, it, take out the core and you implant this inflow cannula into the ventricular chamber or the cavity. And the pump itself sits inside the body. So it is in the pericardial space or the sac that covers the heart. It sits in there and it only has this drive line, which is then connected to either an electrical circuit or batteries that comes out. And then you have this outflow graph that comes out and then connects to the aorta or, and that then supplies blood to the body. It is a complex system. So you have the actual pump, then you have the controller, you have the monitor, you have the batteries, and then you have the adapters. So there are lots of components that go into this ventricular assist device. Some of the things like the monitor you only see in the hospital. You definitely go home with multiple batteries and battery chargers and your own controllers. And you have to learn how to switch from controllers, you have to learn how to switch controllers in case of emergencies. You have to learn how to change batteries, charge your batteries, switch from a wall socket to batteries. So those are some of the things, complicated things that if you do decide to go home, you have to learn. Again, looking at this uh, pump closely. So you have the actual pump, you have this cannula that sits inside um, the heart, and this, this machine actually is a one moving part. Again, these are two magnets. Over here on the right, you can see these are two magnets. So it's magnetic, um, magnetically levitated. So these are two magnets. And using the magnetic force, um, the, the rotary moves and the rotor moves. And it has a short inflow cannula and this outflow graft, what we call this graft that sits into the body. And it has a very thin drive line. Drive line being, um, you know, the line that connects. It has all the wires and the wiring which connects to the battery or the, um, or, or the, um, 
you know, the circuit or the uh, plug points in your house. And this is how it is placed in the in the body. So you can, we call it pericardial placement. So it is placed in the apex, snugging the heart right next to you know the lungs in the pericardial space or the space, the sac that covers the heart. It sits right there in the cavity. And so if you took somebody's chest X-ray who had this device, you would actually see this device on X-ray because it's all metal. So when would we use this device, right? So we would use it in children with anticipation for long waiting times because potentially you can go home on this device. It, is, it can be used as a bridge to decision or candidacy. So in patients who have um, you know, chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy to decide whether they're eligible for a transplant, it can be used in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients as destination therapy. So this is a study, again, from the Action Network. We're doing great work with VADS, pediatric VADS, from Dr. Auerbach and Dr. Simpson and other investigators. Um, you can see here that um, in patients, they studied 50 patients who got the HVAD, and they looked at their outcomes. So this dark dotted line are patients who got the device, uh, who got transplanted after getting the device. The, the short dotted line are patients who are alive on device, and the black solid line are the patients who died, unfortunately. And you can see here that, that only 4% um, um, only of the patients died um, in the first 12 months after uh, putting the putting the VAD. And at the end of one year, 70% of these patients got transplanted and 22% of these patients were alive on device. And in 6% of these patients, they were actually able to wean the device. So they were able to remove it. So most likely those patients recovered. And this is again, the most important point from that paper. So, um, uh, over here, you see that neurologic dysfunction, which they include both stroke, so true ischemic stroke or hemorrhage or any bleeding in the brain. And 7% of the patients, only three patients had any sort of uh, neurologic dysfunction. So this is again, very good data to show that um, patients are doing very well on, in the recent era on ventricular assist devices. Now let's talk about the, the, the newest kid on the block, the HeartMate 3. So again, this is a centrifugal pump, just like the heart, um, um, the heart wear, the one that I discussed before. It has one moving part, has an inflow cannula and an outflow graft and a drive line, just like the previous one. So let me show you a quick video, which will help you explain how this device works. So you can see here, this is a beating heart and you can see this device that is sitting right next to the heart. And um, this is the graft that goes and um, connects to the main blood vessel that is the aorta. And so blood gets sucked out from the left ventricle and then gets put into the ascending aorta that goes to the body. That's how it's assisting um, the heart. Now, if we look inside the heart, uh, inside the, um, the machine. So this is the direction of the blood flow. So the blood is getting sucked out of the ventricle. This is the rotor, the motory, and it's a rotary pump. And you can see it's a continuous flow. There is no pulsing compared to the Berlin heart where it was a pulse, a pulsatile device. This is a, a continuous flow device. So this is the pump cable and this is the modular cable or the drive lines, and they connect to this controller, which is outside the body. So somewhere along this, this cable gets threaded outside the body, and you have this mod, uh, controller that sits outside the body. So um, I hope that helped you understand how this, um, this uh, pump works. So again, you have this inflow cannula that comes out, um, um, comes out of the pump and sits into the left ventricle. Blood gets sucked out. This is the rotor, which is magnetically levitate, uh, levitated. Um, and you have this outflow to the aorta. 
Um, so recent, recently, because of the data that was provided by the Action Network, FDA approved the labeling of Abbott's HeartMate 3 for pediatric use, which was a very uh, important uh, announcement for the pediatric heart failure world. And as you can look, this device is quite bulky. That is an adult size hand down there. So it is a big device, so it can only be implanted in big size patients, not in our babies, unfortunately. And um, uh, it is then connected uh, to the batteries on the side, or it can also be connected to a socket. And it is used in older children with long anticipated waiting times. It can also be again used as bridge to destination, uh, bridge to uh, decision, and it can be used as destination therapy. So in adults, uh, the, the numbers down here are, are amazing from an adult standpoint. They have 83% survival on this device. There is only a 10% stroke rate, and there is only a 1% thrombosis risk, which is the lowest that adults have seen in a long time. And this device is, that's why one of the latest and the greatest um, in, the, in the field of that. So Action Network actually studied um, the HeartMate 3 in pediatric patients. And as you can see here, um, lots of devices uh, were being implanted from 2017 when the device was initially approved all the way to 2019. And you see this huge surge. So more and more centers are using HeartMate 3s in their adult-sized um, patients. And the most important part is that in their study um, um, of, uh, I think, 70, 60 patients, Oh, sorry, 35 patients, they saw no pump thrombosis, no strokes at all. So these patients were, um, um, uh, were supported for um, 78 days, um, a median number of days was uh, 40. So these patients were supported for a decent amount of time and there were absolutely no strokes or pump thrombosis. The last device that I just want to quickly mention is the total artificial heart. It is not a very commonly used uh, device. Um, it, it is in patients who have both sides of the heart, um, the right and the left have failed and you now need support for both sides. Um, it is a pump, and again, a pneumatic pump that uh, you can connect to the heart. Uh, over here, you can see this patient uh, has these two cords that come out uh, and connect to the to the battery um, and to the controller uh, here. But um, again, um, uh, this is very similar to a bivad setup, but you actually cut out the ventricles and you replace them with these pumps. So in summary, end-stage heart failure uh, in pediatrics, uh, the gold standard therapy is uh, transplantation. Uh, VAD treatment provides option for survival with improved quality of life, and that is the most important part of ventricular assist devices. VAD utilization has increased recently, and post-transplant outcomes in the current era have actually also improved, and the weightless mortality has gone down significantly in the current era of pediatric VADs. Uh, VADs can be classified as short, long-term. They can be bridged to recovery, to transplant, to decision, to destination. There are many devices that are available, uh, like pulsatile flow devices, continuous flow devices, some of which I showed you. And the VAD selection is based on patient's age, patient's weight, heart size, and some other factors. Um, and even though there are many complications with VADs, though not seen as commonly in pediatrics as in the adults, um, outcomes are improving. These complications are reducing. So um, complications like stroke, thrombus, bleeding, arrhythmia, infections, RV failure. Um, there are many complications, and that's why um, we still don't jump to VADs. But um, because all our outcomes are improving, our um, overall VAD outcomes are improving and action with Action Network, you can see that their stroke rates have gone down significantly in the current era. I think um, there's a lot of hope. And uh, with that, I would like to thank once again, the CCF for giving me this opportunity um, to talk today. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you.
Thank you, Niha. That's that was wonderful, and it certainly is uh, very encouraging um, and helpful uh, for families who are potentially facing um, the the idea of of you know a VAD um, with their child's care. Um, if anybody has questions, you can always uh, you know submit them now onto our the control panel. I do have one question that someone um, did ask. Um, they said, what are some of the lifestyle restrictions uh, for children who might be, um, you know, living with a, one of the mobile devices? That's a very good question. So um, these um, patients are, as you can imagine, on uh, anticoagulation, so blood thinners. So some of the changes that to their lifestyle they have to make is, of course, like no contact sports. Um, you know, you just have to be careful of, um, you know, um, uh, not having a trauma to yourself in any uh, shape or form. Um, though the batteries last you for a long period of time, I think that is something that you have to consider every time you're going out or traveling. Uh, you make you want to make sure that you have enough battery life. You carry the extra batteries with you. So very very long journeys may be challenging um, because you want to be able to have enough battery support. So those would be some of the the lifestyle choices um, changes that one has to make. Uh, but of course the adults um, have been living with it and pushing boundaries. People go surfing. People go traveling, hiking, biking. Um, so you know these are some of the things that the adults are doing and slowly as we are getting more comfortable discharging our pediatric patients with VADs to home, I'm hoping that um, the patients also are able to enjoy their life while they wait for a heart transplant. Thank you. Um, so what type of educational preparation or uh, do families um, have it while in the hospital before they are discharged on a VAD? What is that like? That's a very Yes, that's a very good question. So um, extensive teaching happens, as you can imagine. I have personally discharged a few VADs home and those have been teenagers. So of course, a lot of education happens with the teenagers themselves because um, you know, we, we do want them to be aware of their, their devices and the careful um, you know, things that they need to, careful instructions that they need to follow. Um, there are, um, of course, like there are modules that Action Network is slowly producing um, in terms of like education. There are handbooks that are now available by the Action Network um, for parents to go through. Um, we definitely do elaborate teaching about just the mechanics of the device. And then everyone goes through all the alarms um, that uh, patients um, may hear, you know, because in the middle of the night, what to do when the when your uh, VAD starts to beep, what are the different alarms, um, then what are what to do when you either run out of battery or power goes out at home and you can't charge your batteries, what to do if you're dry, if you notice, you know, um, blood or um, any sort of pus or anything anywhere. So elaborate teaching happens um, prior to discharge for many, many days. Um, and obviously, um, you know, the, the parents are more than welcome to, um, you know, read these new resources that are being avail made available by the Action Network for parent education and come back and ask more questions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, last question was, can you just clarify what type of VAD is available to young infants? Is it only the hardware and the Berlin Heart? Is that the only two that are available? Uh -huh. So, so the hardware, uh, so in infants, when you say uh, babies, mm -hmm. hardware is still a much bulkier device that is still um, not available in infants per se in, in, in smaller kids. So, um, you know, a couple of years or older in, in infants and in toddler and in, in babies, um, most likely it'll either be the Berlin heart or it will be the, the PD mag, the first one that I showed you guys, which was sitting, that is a temporary um, short-term device that uh, sometimes patient uh, people are using more like the outcomes are good so short-term sort of becomes some mid-term uh, but uh, uh, PD mags and Berlin hearts are some of the um, are, are the two devices that I think are available for infants for babies 
Thank you. Um, I, I see that we are coming up on the hour. Um, if there are any other questions, um, what I will do is I will send them to Dr. Benzel and she will um, gladly uh, respond and I will email those answers to everyone uh, in the session this evening. I wanna thank you, Dr. Benzel. This was so informative and so interesting and we really appreciate your time tonight. Absolutely. Thank you, Cindy, so much for organizing this. I really want to thank the CCF. Uh, so much advocacy work, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have been a fellow uh, research scholar of the CCF and now, um, uh, you know, still being associated with CCF. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight.
Thank <laughs> you. 